Jericho, and I am, uh, as I've said often, about as excited as a person can be about this opportunity. I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be part of the University of Minnesota. Thank you for welcoming me. Now we will do introductions and recognitions, so President Kaler, please join me at the podium. Good afternoon. We have three individuals to introduce uh, and uh, welcome today and uh, thank today. Uh, first, I'm pleased to introduce Amy Phoenix. Uh, she's the new Chief of Staff at the University of Minnesota. And Amy, would you please join us? Amy was the ideal candidate for this position as my Chief of Staff. She has an extensive background in higher education, public affairs, management, and community relations. She has a terrific previous history and working knowledge of the university, and she served here as the Director of News and Public Information for five years. She also has earned an MBA from the University of Minnesota. I have a great fondness for University of Minnesota alumni. <laughs> she has extraordinary leadership skills. She understands the campus culture here uh, very deeply, and she has a network of extremely strong working relationships, both on campus and in the surrounding communities. Her help will be critical to our success moving forward. It's been a true pleasure to get to know Amy, uh, to work with her, and to have her energy and enthusiasm uh, be part of what we're doing in Morrill Hall. I look forward to partnering with Amy uh, and with all of you in moving our great university forward. Amy, please enjoy your time at the University of Minnesota, and would you all please join me in welcoming her to her new position. Thank you so much. Um, mostly I want to thank everybody for such a warm welcome. Um, the staff in the Board of Regents office, um, Ann Cieslak, have um, created a home away for ho from home for me for the past uh, couple of months until I moved into Morrill Hall last Friday. Um, Regents have individually and collectively welcomed me. The senior leadership team here has been just wonderful in reorienting me to the university. And of course, uh, President Kaler has um, placed a lot of trust and confidence in me. And I so much look forward to serving the university. So thank you all. I'm pleased now to recognize Frank Strahan, who served as chair of the Civil Service Committee, the CSC, uh, for 2010 to 11. So Frank, would you please come forward? Thank you. <clears throat> the CSC is a volunteer committee appointed by the president. Its members provide invaluable service to the civil service employee community, to the Office of Human uh, Resources, and to the university as a whole. Its members volunteer considerable time and expertise and go well above and beyond their paid positions to represent their constituents and participate in the critically important shared governance structure of our university. The committee focuses a great deal of their time and attention on a number of issues, such as civil service advocacy, communications, compensation, benefit, rules, and professional development. As chair, Frank played a key leadership role on the committee, which has had a positive impact on the U and on civil service employees in many ways. Significant accomplishments include moving from a committee to a Senate structure, and which was just recently approved by the Board of Regents. Please join me in thanking Frank for his dedication and leadership to CSC and to the University of Minnesota. Thank you, Frank.
Our third recognition today is Sarah Waldemar. She has been chair of the Council of the Academic Professionals and Administrators, CAPA, for 2010 to 11. And Sarah, please join us. Thank you. Appreciate your help. CAPA advises and consults with the President and the Administration on the development and implementation of policies and procedures impacting the professional and administrative employees at the University. It's comprised of elected representatives from individual colleges, schools, institutes, and centers, as well, as well as central units and each coordinate campus. Its activities focus on representation and governance, benefits and compensation, communications, and professional development and recognition. As its chair, Sarah plays a key leadership role in the committee, leading the group in reviewing and contributing to a number of policy, personnel, and governance initiatives. Significant accomplishments in this year have been in moving this committee to a Senate structure, which also was approved by the Board of Regents at the end of the fall semester. Please join me in thanking Sarah for her leadership and her dedication to the University of Minnesota. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you. A second? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? If there's no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Um, the next report is the report from our president, President Kaler. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon. Uh, I do have to reflect that this is a considerably more relaxed venue than the last time I was with you in this room, and so uh, I had a much more uh, relaxed morning today. Thank you. It really is a great honor for me to make my first President's Report to the Board of Regents. Uh, we have a gem of a university, and it will become even more excellent, more accessible, more efficient, more entrepreneurial, and more proud of its accomplishments in the years to come. New leaders at all levels are measured and sometimes pressured by their first 100 days. I'm not prepared to report on that yet, but I will tell you instead about my first 100 hours in Minnesota. Even in that short, hectic time, I've seen firsthand in many ways just how important and beloved this university is to this state's citizens. On day one, July 1st, I received the royal treatment from our kind colleagues in human resources, I prove that I'm an American citizen and, in fact, an eligible employee. We can all relax. I moved into my office, as did my new and still fledgling staff. We met with press and colleagues and began the big job of unpacking. By day four, my wife Karen and I celebrated Independence Day in Delano at the state's oldest and largest Fourth of July parade. Uh, riding in an open car behind a hundred extraordinarily energetic members of our marching band uh, as they played and danced their way around the parade route. I also got to meet Goldie the Gopher for the first time up close and in person. Yesterday was nonstop, beginning at 6 a.m. for the morning news shows, again with the band and Goldie uh, greeting me, and uh, then off to work, uh, preparing for uh, many important activities, including this meeting and our coming uh, retreat. During these first days, it's striking to me just how much affection exists for the U, how close the scrutiny and focus is on all that we do, and just how big a fish this university is in the sea of a vast and complex state. I think it's good to be a th big fish. I welcome it. Big fish create big impacts, and big fish get to take big bites out of big problems. I know this is my first Regents meeting, and I'm brand new, but there's much work to get done. I will be listening a lot during these first 100 days, and I look forward to reaching out to deans, department chairs, faculty, and staff. I know this period of transition can be difficult and cause anxious days for many, and my hope is to reduce that anxiety and to infuse my enthusiasm into the university as we move forward. 
I look forward to being a tireless advocate. I plan to be known as the university's most visible and vocal cheerleader. I'm eager to use the president's megaphone to champion our faculty, our staff, our students, our reputation, and yes, our funding. And I will always be excited to spread the word about our remarkable successes. Let me take a minute to highlight a couple of the more recent ones. As you've read, the Clinical and Translational Science Institute won a $51 million grant from the National Institutes of Health. It's the largest grant the university has ever received. It's a wide-ranging award from funding data collection on diabetes, obesity, and high blood pressure to helping high school students embrace the biological sciences. Last week, eight of our students, four graduate students and four undergrads, were awarded Fulbright grants so they could study in Germany or India or Morocco. And a recent article in the Times of London lists the university as having the fourth most influential mathematics program in the world, behind only Johns Hopkins, Stanford, and Berkeley. That's the news, that sort of news is what Minnesotans and their political leaders need to hear more about. Let me spend a little time on the funding issue, which will occupy substantial amounts of our collective attention. There's been much made recently about the 5% hike in tuition that President Brunig's recommended and that you approved in your tentative budget last month. That's a larger increase in tuition than I would like to see, but it's also important, important to put that in the context of the national situation. For example, last year the University of Arizona saw a 20% tuition increase. Tuition at UCLA, UCLA and Berkeley rose 21%, and it was up 13% at the University of Washington. It's a time of very great difficulty in higher education, public higher education across the country. These tuition hikes are unfortunate, but so have been the massive cuts from the state of Minnesota. Of course, we are prepared to do our part to deal with the economic realities we face, but outsized cuts to the university prevent the kind of educational and creative advances that lead to economic stability. Put simply, they are counterproductive. Unfortunately, in this current state funding environment, tuition increases are bound to happen. We will do our best to limit them while raising private scholarship dollars and dedicating resources towards scholarships. We want higher education to be accessible to all of our young people and their families. It would not only be morally wrong for, this to let, for us to let this become a place that only the affluent can attend, it would also devastate Minnesota's economy. The university has become excellent through years of work by thousands of people. We cannot stop striving to be the best that we can be in education, research, service, and clinical care. We must be the place that sets the agenda for the future and equips our students to lead it. There's no greater investment for a state to make than in its university, and you can be sure that I will deliver that message early, often, and continuously. At the same time, I will remind you that state support is now at about 18 percent of our total budget. We must work hard to grow the other 82 percent of our revenue streams, and we will do that. The other side of the coin is cost, and another issue being kicked around has been the number of administrators and the amount of money we spend on administration at the university. I do know that our professional staff is excellent at what it does. These experts in their field are a crucial spine to the body of this institution. If they go away, we don't function. But believe me, we must trim administrative costs, and we will do that. We must clearly view these costs, benchmark our efforts, and be excellent in what we do. Still, in my view, the real issue isn't the number of administrators, and it's not the price of our tuition. The real issue is excellence, and the real issue is increasing the value that we, the university, bring to the state of Minnesota, to its stakeholders, and to our students. Increasing that value Communicating it and demonstrating it will be the major goal of my presidency. Now, we have to take this conversation outside this room and across the state. I'm poised to be the lead member of this other kind of Gopher marching band, and I hope you'll join with me as we move forward with an optimistic, inspirational, and entrepreneurial era for this great university. We need to help the citizens of the state of Minnesota and the leaders of the state of Minnesota rediscover the value of this place. We need not be shy about who we are, about how good we are, and about how much better we can become. When 
I was selected as the 16th president of the university, Bob Brunig said he wanted to make this the smoothest transition ever. I think he met that goal, and I'm very grateful to the transition committee for all it's done over the past eight months. Special thanks go to Ann Cieslak, who has led this process, and Ann, I'm very grateful to you for your tremendous help. Thank you. Finally and sadly, I would like to honor the memories of two special members of the university committee, uh, community who recently passed. Regretfully, I never had the opportunity to make, meet Richard Pinky McNamara or Peter Zetterberg, but I've heard and read about these great men. Of course, the building where we sit today is the result of a generous contribution by Mr. McNamara, a standout Gophers athlete, a former regent, and a model of what this kind of land-grant institution can and should produce. Pinky was from Hastings, one of six boys raised by a single mother who worked as a nurse's aide. Pinky understood what the U gave to him, and he gave back with great passion. Peter Zetterberg, the senior analyst in the Office of Undergraduate Education, was a font of knowledge about this place, possessed a bundle of devotion to it, and always clearly expressed his incisive points of view. Greg Fox described him as, quote, the kind of person every intellectually honest decision maker wants in the room. Those are true words of tribute. We are thankful for all that Pinky and Peter gave to and did for the university. They will be missed. Madam Chair, I am delighted to be with you. I look forward to a long and productive working relationship with you and with this board. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'll speak for myself and I hope for the rest of the board that we are all very eager to join your new marching band and talk about the excellence of the University of Minnesota. Thank, Thank you. you again. The next item is the chair's report, and so I get to say a few words. And I'm very happy and honored to be able to make this report. The first thing I want to do is to recognize Regent Allen for his outstanding service as chair of this board over the past two years. And I want to present him with this engraved gavel. on behalf of the board, the whole board, and I know that Regent Allen has another gavel that he has used made out of the wood of the, Const the USS Constitution, but I hope that you will cherish this gavel equally. And I want to thank him for his extraordinary leadership during the presidential search and the transition and his, to me, extraordinary willingness to hop in his car any time he was needed and be here. So we appreciate all that you have done. Join me in thanking Regent Allen. If I may just say something, I will say a thank you to all of you who have made this uh, task the past two years, and in fact, my entire eight years on the board, just one of the most enjoyable and uh, I think uh, useful parts of my life. So thank you very, very much to all of you. Okay. Thank you, and we appreciate your service enormously. The second item uh, is another great honor and pleasure and privilege, which is to once again welcome President Kaler for his first, to his first board meeting. We hope that after you're done with this board meeting, you will really still feel as excited as I you did when you answered some questions in an interview. I have the interview with me, and I'm going to read the last paragraph because I was so taken with it. When President Kaler was asked, how have you prepared for the job emotionally, at the end he said, I'm just about as excited as a human being can be to be here. I really, truly am. It's very meaningful. And we're really as excited as you to have you here. You. So welcome once again. Thank you. The third announcement that I have is that the board's next regular meeting will be held on September 8th and 9th, 2011, on the Twin City campus. That ends my report. The next item is we will receive and file reports, which are listed in the docket materials, pages 5 through 17. Um, no action is needed. They include a Civil Service Committee report, and thank you, and also a CAPA report 
and we thank you for that report also. The next item is the consent report. Um, is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? Second. Thank you. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion about the consent agenda? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? The motion passes. We will now have nominations for the UMMCF, the Un University of Minnesota Medical Center Fairview Board of Trustees. Uh, the materials are in your docket. And Regent Allen, will you present the recommendations, please? Thank you, uh, Chair Cohen. The nominating committee met uh, and makes the following recommendations for the University of Minnesota Medical Center Fairview Board of okay. Trustees. The committee unanimously recommends the following appointees to the University of Minnesota Medical Center Fairview Board of Trustees. Bobby Daniels for a term of three years, Connie Delaney for a term of three years, Mark Paler for a term of one year completing the term uh, of Lynn Blaywood. Uh, I move the approval of these appointments. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. The next item is an important one, the preliminary 2012 state capital budget request. Vice Presidents O'Brien and Fitz and Ryder, will you please come to the table? And President Kaler, uh, would you have some introductory remarks for us? Yes, thank you, Chair Cohen. Um, in the future, uh, you may expect me to present these kind of reports in uh, some detail, but in the interest of time and efficiency in recognizing that this is my uh, fifth day on the job, I've asked uh, Vice Presidents O'Brien and Fitzenreuter to provide uh, the narrative. Uh, it's been previewed uh, for you uh, in committee, and I believe you have the presentation uh, in front of you. So I will turn this over to uh, Vice President O'Brien. Uh, Madam Chair, President Kaler and board members, it's our pleasure to present the preliminary 2012 capital request. Of course, uh, the what we are trying to achieve with our capital request is fulfillment of the university's mission. And we have before us uh, the timeline of events. Today we're reviewing the preliminary capital request uh, which we're doing because it's a standard practice that the Office of Management and Budget at the State of Minnesota and the relevant uh, legislative committees uh, will visit us during the summer to review potential capital requests. In the fall, we'll be returning with a finalized capital request for your review and then ask you to take action on that in October, and we're hopeful that there'll be consideration of a bonding bill in the legislative session next spring and be back to you next May and June for action on the 2013 capital budget. Uh, this preliminary project list that's before you is unprioritized at this time. When we return in the fall, we will have it in priority order. If you uh, look at pages 30 to 34 in your, your docket, you will see uh, detailed information about each project. As we know, the Higher Education Asset Preservation and Replacement funds from the state of Minnesota are used for the purpose of stewarding the university's facilities. Uh, this year we'll be focusing specifically on energy efficient funds which will not only increase energy efficiency by replacing aging and obsolete equipment, but also uh, achieve greater operational efficiency and savings. We'll also look at building systems such as roofs, building envelopes, uh, and electrical and mechanical systems. And uh, we'll be prioritizing these requests using our facility condition assessment and of course a fair and balanced allocation across the university system. Uh, the second proposal is the ambulatory care clinic. Uh, the current clinic facilities were built in the early 70s and they were built to serve about 150,000 patients. 
our current use of the facilities are close to 600,000 patients a year. A new clinic would replace about three-fourths of our current clinics and uh, are very essential to the health of our academic um, health center enterprise and our clinical enterprise. The American Indian Learning Resource Center was has been in a past uh, capital requests and are, is back before us again today. This project would house 17 programs that are currently scattered throughout the UMD campus that would be co-located in this new facilities. American, the American Indian community compromises the largest minority population at UMD and is one of the largest American Indian programs in the country. Uh, UMD's strong uh, support system for American Indian students has resulted in graduation rates significantly higher than national norms. The Eddie Hall and Space Optimization Project is the next step in our effort to optimize space across the university campus. At your last meeting, you approved the demolition and decommissioning of 10 buildings, and which helped us achieve close to a million dollars in operating savings. Uh, this particular report would be a restoration of Eddie Hall, currently the oldest building on the Twin Cities campus, as a new home for the admission programs for international and transfer students. The Freshman Welcome Center uh, for Admissions would continue in Jones Hall. This project will improve utilization of about 100,000 square feet of office and academic support space. And because of the renovation of Eddy and uh, repurposing of Don Howe, we will be able to decommission Fraser and Williamson Halls and will save $1.1 million per year in operating costs and avoid an estimated $35 million in restoration in a 10-year period. Uh, the old main utilization, utility building renovation is really to achieve our three principles that guide our utilities and energy management within the university. Uh, to ensure that we have continued reliability in our seam construction uh, and reduces the risk from having all of our steam and our steam production in one facility at the southeast plant. Uh, it will improve our sustainability program, combining heat and power to reduce our campus carbon footprint by 10%. And our final um, principle of controlling costs, it will provide a financial head against, hedge against future electrical rates and provide steam and electricity more efficiently on the Twin Cities campus. The next proposal is the physics uh, nanotech building, which uh, the board has received presentations on many times before. We received de design funding from the state in 2012, and indeed, as of this summer, our design is complete for physics nano, and we would be ready to start construction of the program. Physics is a core department of the College of Science and Engineering and an integral component of the science technology engineering and math education. Our current physics building is obsolete for the kind of research being done. The facility will include state-of-the-art research labs, a 5,000 square foot clean room dedicated to nanotech and student meeting space. It will be a direct, located directly north of the Scholars Walk and adjacent to uh, the Sci College of Science and Engineering. Finally, our research and outreach centers, the Itasca Improvement Project, again, was before the board in the past and part of our request in past years. The university maintains more than 30 regional extension research and outreach centers throughout the state. The Itasca Biological Station is a unique setting within Itasca State Park. Currently, it serves 150 students and faculty daily during the summer and 75 daily during the winter. It provides innovative research and educational programs in an experiential hands-on environment. 
the new campus center will be a year round facility and multi purpose building and reduce single function buildings and will save energy and operational costs and then we'll turn to the financial summary and vice president fitz and Ryder. Madam Chair, members of the committee, this slide outlines for you the uh, total cost. If you start with the column on the far right of the slide, the total uh, capital investment here is roughly $460 million. The university share of that, you can see for uh, HEPR, that is 100% funded by the state of Minnesota. The ambulatory care clinic project at $200 million would be shared 50-50 between the uh, state share and the university total here of $100 million. Uh, both the American Indian Learning Center, Eddie Hall, and the Old Main and the Physics Nano and the Itasca facility improvements uh, do reflect the traditional two-thirds, one-third share of those projects. That is the customary practice at the state of Minnesota. So the university share is $166.6 million, and the state share is $293.3 million. Um, the process here, this is a uh, July meeting to review and approve the preliminary capital request to the state of Minnesota. This is a, uh, uh, why is it here at this time? Again, to remind the board, the state of Minnesota, despite being shut down, uh, has a process and a system in place, and we uh, need to finish loading into the financial system at the state, our preliminary state capital request. We will be back. Why do we do that now, by the way? Um, some members of the committee re may recall that in the uh, normally, again, I always have to preface normally here, uh, legislators, the capital investment committees in the August and September time frame traditionally tour the state looking at projects and the university, Minsk, you other uh, State and local governments submit their projects at this time and they go on that list and they're reviewed. Um, but you will get another bite at this apple in September where we'll bring the final prioritized list as well as the final cost estimates for these projects. They are preliminary cost estimates. You'll review that in September, take action, final action in October, and then the legislative session in 2012 will commence, which is the normal bonding session. And then we'll be back in the summer of 2012 with the outcome. I will tell you that as it's been pointed out, there are uh, three projects on this list that are still pending at the Capitol. Uh, we are still hopeful and working hard to see if there'll be a bonding bill before, or if and when there is a special session. Um, we're still fighting for that, and uh, three of these projects certainly reflect uh, the carryover from that, but we're still hopeful that something could happen on those projects yet this year. Um, this is the resolution uh, for the board, and it is, a again, a preliminary. You're just approving the preliminary request. Uh, Regent Simmons. Thank you, Chair Cohen. I would like to have some guidance because I'd like to vote on this request, but I want to recuse on the ambulatory care clinic. And ordinarily, when something's buried in a bigger project, recusal is not necessary, but this is a big chunk of big projects, so I'd like to recuse. So please let me know when to, how you want to handle that, and I'll step out. Okay, thank you. I think for both, if there's any discussion on the ambulatory care and then a vote, which will be a preliminary vote on this, a vote on the preliminary resolution uh, that you should step out. Thank so you. for both discussion and, and the vote. Again, just to clarify for the board, this is a review and preliminary action on this proposal, on this resolution. And again, it will come back to us for action in September, for review in September and action in October, and which will not be preliminary. I hope that clarifies things for the regents. <laughs> Um, and now, uh, thank you, Vice Presidents O'Brien and Fitz and Ryder, and are there questions and discussion uh, from the Regents, although I think we need a motion for the resolution on the floor first. Regent Fabinius. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the resolu resolution. 
Okay, thank you. Is there a second? A second, Regent Allen. All right, we've had a move moved and second. Now is there discussion? Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we heard the discussion this morning in the Facilities Committee, and uh, I direct my uh, comments to the old main utility building renovation, uh, $81 million, and uh, Regent Broad also, uh, we talked about this briefly. What is the opportunity of not doing this and buying electric, le electricity and other utilities commercially? And if we do do it, pass on it, what are the opportunities to sell any of the utilities to commercial enterprises in the area? Vice President O'Brien, Fitz and Ryder, whichever wants to go first. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, President Kaler and board members, uh, the development of a combined heat and power plant will sustain the operation of the University of Minnesota. At this point, there is not a district energy provider capable of providing power to the university that we could purchase it from. There's district heating in downtown Minneapolis, district heating in, in downtown St. Paul. There is not a distribution center that is linked to the University of Minnesota. So any expansion of a private system would require a large investment of capital by a private entity. Uh, in terms of our combined heat and power uh, proposal, yes, we would be generating electricity sufficient that we would be able to sell it back to the grid um, or to others in the immediate area. And uh, down the road, if we were to see, for example, the development of the um, railroad land adjacent to the biosciences district by private entities, there would be an opportunity down the road to have a public-private partnership in the development of energy supply to the campus and to an adjacent area that would be developed. But uh, at, at this point, uh, there's not an immediate uh, private sector entity that we could purchase from. Well, Madam Chair, follow up? Yes. Madam Chair, uh, Vice President O'Brien, I think that uh, before we solidify this uh, issue in September, we ought to look at all possibilities, uh, further inspection of the issue to see if there is some competition or opportunities for, for revenue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regent Broad. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Vice President O'Brien, I'm, I'm curious about um, how we chose to uh, finance the uh, old utility building renovation. I, I'm wondering about um, if you gave consideration to, to uh, utilizing some of that through Heaper. Can you split things, uh, finance some of it through a, a renovation and others through Heaper? I'm just thinking about drawing down more uh, of the state dollars uh, as opposed to the university contribution. And then I had a second question that I'll, I'll wait. All right. Vice President O'Brien. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, President Kaler, Regents and uh, Regent Broad. Uh, yes, we have in the past utilized HEPR dollars to fund utility improvements. For example, on the St. Paul campus, we renovated a historic structure and made it into a chiller plant that serves 18 buildings that in the past had individual chiller units and have achieved substantial operation savings for that. It, it would be possible to identify <coughs> an element of the uh, of the old main restoration as a heaper project, but that would be, uh, again, increasing our heaper request because the heaper request we have is really addressing only a, a very limited portion of our renewal and restoration needs on campus. Thank you. 
Just a, a second, follow -up second question. question actually is for uh, Vice President Fitzenreiter. I'm wondering about if there's any consistency in this might sound like a crazy question in legislative behavior. And what I, what, I, what I mean by that is I'm wondering if there's any correlation over time between the amount that the university asks for and the amount that they receive. It, Madam Chair, members of the committee, history would show that the more you ask for, the more you get. <laughs> um, but that said also, um, historically, um, higher ed seems to land within a pretty small band of percentage of the state bonding bill. That year after year, biennium after biennium, higher ed falls, if the, if the bill for us is, if the bonding bill is a billion dollars, we tend to land in somewhere in the 15 to 18 percent of the bonding bill, pretty consistently. It's, it just seems to happen. I don't know if it's planned, but it tends to happen that way. Just as a follow-up, Madam Chair, I, I, I'm wondering, um, just, just for argument's sake, um, if, 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 you, if the university received all of what it asked for in this, in this um, request, um, does the amount still fit within our debt guidelines? Uh, if you got everything on your wish list. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the the board, um, we reviewed that in the Finance Committee this morning, and the answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Regent Frobenius. A um, couple of observations and, and comments about this, and maybe a clarification on our process. First, we, <clears throat> as uh, Vice President Fitzen reduced, we did review in the Finance Committee this morning this against our financial ratios uh, and our debt, debt levels. and. Uh, um, we are substantially within those, those numbers with, with this process. This project, this budget has, has two significant elements um, that are, have some unique characteristics to them. The, the Ambulatory Care Clinic is a critical facility to the continued success and viability of the University's of Minnesota's Medical School. And if we fail at that mission, we fail failed about everything else we do in the state of Minnesota. So it's an absolutely critical process. It's got some tricky ways as to how to get this financed. Um, the uh, utility project that's been presented, I know less about, and I will know more, but uh, I know less about right now. Uh, but I also understand how that can be such a sort of an Achilles heel of an organization. And some trend among major institutions to really take more of their utility operation in-house. Both of these projects, historically when we look at capital budget items, even in the fall time frame, we sort of look at the financing plan and what it's going to, what's the overall impact on our total operation costs going to be. I've requested on behalf of the Finance Committee to both of these projects that we have a substantially more in-depth review of these projects so we understand the, the financial pro forma of the ambulatory clinic and how that's going to work out for the university. And secondly, on the, on the utility project, understand sort of what's the replacement cost, what's the payback of the energy improvement elements of this thing, and, and look at that beyond just what its overall impact is on operating costs. So I think these two projects are, criti uh, are, are critical to the U. They do require some further analysis before we go ahead and sort of putting this on notice that I believe we should conduct it. We, we will, at least in my committee, attempt to conduct that analysis. Okay. Thank you, Regent Frobenius. Regent Svigum. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, fellow Regents, I feel a little uncomfortable in voting on this preliminary project before we know what the priorities are. Um, I think I heard Fitz say that we would set the priority list in September after already approving the preliminary projects. And, uh, folks, very honestly, uh, you know, generally at the Capitol, you'll get 150 million bucks someplace in that neighborhood. When you say Regent Johnson for the university, and uh, we're requesting about 300 million, I think, in this request from from the state. It would seem to me that we ought to uh, prioritize before we go ahead and approve a preliminary budget. Now, I guess that's not the way it's done here, but uh, it would sure seem to me to make sense to do. To do the prioritization first, and I'm uncomfortable in, uh, first of all, not knowing what the legislature is going to do this year. Uh, many of these requests are before them. I do believe it will be a bridge to finish this session. I do believe that, um, but it's 
Did, I'm, I'm uncomfortable voting before we prioritize. Thank you, Regent Sviggum. I can understand that. I think what we're saying is to give the administration an opportunity to move forward and plan, and certainly we have the opportunity then in our discussion in September and our vote in October to decide what we want to do with the priorities that they have set forth. So this is a first round preliminary vote. Mr. Re I'm, my vote also gives the approval before I know what the priority is. Sure. I, mean, I, 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 I think there's two ways to look at it. I understand that. Uh, Regent Allen, um, then I think Regent I, Allen. I want to make a point, but I, I want to follow up on the, on the point here, too. I think by giving the preliminary approval, we're saying as a, as a board, this is the package we want to send forward. Uh, then when you get into the legislature, as you know very well, uh, they're going to want to know, well, which ones come first. And so we will have done that in September well before they need to start discussing it. They may have gone out during the summer in normal times and looked at the projects uh, without knowing the priority order. But by the time they get around to discussing it, they would have our uh, priority order. Uh, the point I wanted to make uh, it goes back to uh, Mr. Fitzenreiter's comment about uh, in answer to the question about uh, how much do you ask and how much do you get. And I speak specifically about the HEPRA. Uh, there has been a pretty uh, good track record, I think, uh, that whatever we asked for, we usually got half. <laughs> so that, that was seemed to be true for many years. My point is uh, that doesn't mean we ask for more than we really need. Uh, the request in this particular re uh, uh, report here is about $60 million for HEPRA. If you assume somewhere around $120 for uh, modifying any particular uh, square foot, and, and of course our projects range from chicken coops to high sophisticated scientific laboratories, but if you assume about $120 per square foot for some of the renovations on the average, it takes us 60 years to get around to renovating every square foot. That I think is unacceptable. So we ask for, you know, a reasonable amount. Uh, we sometimes get it, we sometimes don't. But we try to find uh, other ways of uh, ministering to the needs of those buildings because uh, my point is simply that we're not certainly not asking for more than is needed to keep 29 million square feet in good condition. Okay. Thank you, Regent Allen. Uh, we have several regents who want to uh, ask questions or, or comment on this issue. We're scheduled, this board meeting is scheduled to end at 2.30. We have committee reports left, so I want your direction in terms of do you want to continue the conversation for 10 minutes extra and go beyond, or do you want to end on time? Uh, th those who want to continue, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed to going beyond the 2.30? All right. So those of you who are going to ask a question or comment, we won't have, we'll have one question or comment per regent and no follow-ups then. And, I, and please um, make them relatively brief. So right now I have on the list Regent Beeson, Johnson, Frobenius, Broad, and Larson. Okay, Regent Beeson. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Cohen. About a year ago, we began um, placing operating cost estimates next to the, to the capital improvement uh, budget. One of the items in this year's list has the opportunity to actually increase revenue. And as President Kaler talked about in his comments and as we've alluded to over the last um, number of years, we need to increase revenues that, that are unrelated to tuition. And the project that, that I'm most keenly focused on is the ambulatory clerk, uh, care clinic uh, and its potential to actually increase top line and as a result the potential to increase bottom line support for our medical schools. So, you know, we'll see some of that arithmetic as it arrives, I think is important. Uh, this is an area of growth for us, uh, an area of strength, um, but we need to see what those numbers look like uh, before proceeding with a large capital project. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Regent Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fitzenreiter, uh, what projects that are listed here that were passed before. Will you review that? There are some that have already been, because uh, the ambulatory care clinic is new. What else is, uh, what's new and what's old? Uh, 
Madam Chair, members of the committee, the uh, projects that are uh, new on this list first time, the end, in terms of a state request, is the Ambulatory Care Clinic, the Eddie Hall and Space Optimization, and the Old Main Utility. The Physics and Nano, the Itasca, and American Indian are projects that are at the Capitol now uh, before the legislature when they come back if there's a bonding bill and were previously approved by this board, as well as a HEPA request that sits at $35 million at the legislature this past session. So those are the projects that you've reviewed before, and the three, ambulatory care, Eddie Hall, and Old Main are new. Madam Chair, clarification. What are, what's the priority order currently at the legislature of those previous we uh, approved by this board? No. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'll stand corrected, but I believe it's HEPER is number one. Physics and Nano was number two. Oh, and there's a light rail project that's at the legislature as well, but then physics on this list. Then I believe it was American Indian, then that Itasca was the uh, last project on the list that's here that's also at the legislature. Thank you. Regent Frobenius. Well, I just want to respond to a couple of comments that I have great respect for. Um, uh, Regents Sigams, Broad, and, and Johnson's experience with the legislature. I don't pretend to understand it nearly as well as they do. I've always looked at this issue as that this is, I've been told this is necessary to get in the queue. And if we don't put this in as a preliminary request, we're not in the queue and we'll have a much larger time, difficult time bringing the item up at a later date. Therefore, it makes a little sense to me to put some projects that we haven't completed our analysis on in the queue in order to be able to consider them at the proper time. Thank you for that clarification, Re Regent Frobenius. Regent Broad. Actually, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Re Regent Frobenius, I'm in full agreement with you. If this were the request, I would have a different opinion on it than I do today because I do think I need some, personally need some more information um, on a number of the financial project projections on, on a couple of the projects, specifically the, the utility one, uh, most importantly to me. Um, so this is a preliminary package request for consideration. So we can go lower, we just can't go theoretically above, and I'm comfortable uh, with that request today. Regent Larson. Uh, <clears throat> I have a concern about HEPR. This has been going on ever since I've been on the board, which is now over six years. <clears throat> and it has been penny-wise and pound foolish. Um, it, our uh, retrofitting costs have not been uh, well done as a result of this. Usually the retrofitting that has occurred of any major sort, Northrop as an example, has cost us a lot more because of the fact that we did not get the appropriate level of funds to keep the building in shape. I mean, when you think about what happened at Northrop, it is a travesty and a disgrace. When we let an iconic building like that, when I say we, when I say we, I don't mean just the regents. I mean collectively our representatives and us. And we need to figure out how to reposition this thing because uh, Regent Allen is exactly correct. You can't go 60 years and let buildings fall down. And that's exactly what's going to happen if we don't get some relief in this. So I think we need to discuss, and I think we have an inside track here in that we have three former legislators on the Board of Regents who can perhaps give us some advice and counsel as to how we could reposition this and so that the people at the state understand that this way of operating is penny-wise and pound-foolish. Any well-run operation would not allow this to continue. Point well taken, Regent Larson. All right, thank you all for your interesting and important comments. Thank you, Vice President O'Brien and Fitzenreiter for preparing this uh, preliminary uh, report. And now uh, there's a motion on the floor to accept it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. The motion is carried. And uh, thank you all for allowing a little more conversation because I think it was important to, for people to be able to make their comments. So now we will have reports from the committees.
um, the report of the Finance and Operation Committee, Regent Frobenius. Thank you, Madam Chair. Under our consent report, uh, the committee unanimously recommended approval of the consent report, which contained the purchases of goods and services one man and over and are included in the docket information. I move approval of the consent report. Is, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, the committee re first received a presentation, another non-action item, the committee received a presentation dealing with tax compliance issues at the University of Minnesota, an annual item we look at. And the second presentation focused on the financial issues related to the 2012 preliminary state capital budget requests, some of which have been discussed at this meeting. The committee also had a preliminary discussion, several additional suggestions on the 2011 and 12 committee work plan. That concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Regent Frobenius. Report of the Audit Committee, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Chair Cohen. The, the, uh, this morning, the Audit Committee discussed and received information on the proposed annual internal audit plan for fiscal year 2012 and recommended work plan for the committee for this upcoming year. Okay. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Report of the Edu Educational Planning and Policy Committee, Regent Ramirez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Under action items, the committee had a consent report. The committee unanimously recommends approval of the consent report. It, it includes one academic program change. I move its approval. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion carries. Thank you. Under non-action items, the committee discussed the work plan for the coming year. All right. Thank you, Regent Ramirez. Report of the Facilities Committee, Regent Johnson. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, one uh, action item, the committee unanimously recommended approval of the consent report, which contained the purchase of 518 Ontario Street Southeast in Minneapolis. Uh, I move the approval of the consent report. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Madam Chair, uh, two non-action items. The committee reviewed a real estate transaction for the purchase of 724 First Avenue Southwest in Rochester. This item will return to the committee for action at a future meeting. And secondly, the committee also received a presentation on the preliminary 2012 state capital request and discussed the 2011-2012 committee work plan. Madam Chair, this concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Johnson. Report of the Faculty, Staff, and Student Affairs Committee, Regent Simmons. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Uh, the committee unanimously recommends to the board approval of the proposed resolution to amend the faculty retirement plan contribution rate for employees hired or rehired on or after January 2, 2012. These changes position the university for significant cost savings to help offset some of the budget pressure created by reductions in state appropriations. I move adoption of the proposed resolution. Is there a second? second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Regent Frobenius. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Cohen. Uh, I just have a question because the docket material was pretty vague that was provided to all of us on this, uh, none, none of the detail. And my concern was, is that, number one, it was this really based upon a, a careful assessment of the total compensation issues you know, among multiple comparative sites of current data? And two, has this sort of, is this a, uh, an inter, no, I won't say an interim step, but does this end this topic's discussion forever, or is this a topic that we'll have further review going forward? Thank you. Regent Simmons, would you like to respond? Yes, I'd be pleased to. First, with respect to the to the second question, the committee made the statement that we anticipated this was not the last time we would hear this topic and ex uh, expected some potential change in the future. This is a dynamic area across higher education and, frankly, across uh, the larger, larger workforce in terms of how compensation is structured with respect to benefits, and you know that. Um, with respect to benchmarking, the committee was satisfied that this was considered in the context of total um, compensation and the benchmarks used for this particular component, of this benefit, um, was considered satisfactory to the committee for comparison. For further information, though, I would ask uh, if Vice President Brown could answer your, 
your question, Regent Prabenius. Vice President Brown, would you like to come up? Do you have something to uh, add to the question? Uh, Chair Cohen, um, Regent Fabinius, members of the board, uh, we did do a careful study of comparative data for total compensation, and we have looked not only at total compensation but comparables of retirement systems to determine where we fall. Um, you know, we could go through all those numbers. I'm not sure that's exactly what you want here this this afternoon, but we are. Um, interested in maintaining our place in total compensation at this point. We've taken a hard look to learn that dollars invested in retirement benefits or other benefits are the best bang for the buck in terms of the value to employees on total compensation. Um, so I, I think we have a good landing point at this stage of um, progress. We've also done comparisons and looked at some different things with um, um, defined benefit and defined contribution, defined benefit plans. We've tried to even that out. Um, so I think we've done a pretty thorough analysis to make sure we are in um, uh, appropriate comparative ballpark. I might also add that the material provided to the committee today I think would be of interest to Regent Fabinius and perhaps to other members of the board as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Vice President Brown. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there, oh, Regent Frobenius. Um, I, I, I'm still troubled by the item. I probably will vote for it because there's some savings in our current budget that we, we need to achieve. Uh, and I take comfort in the fact that it, there's some revisiting that may, may occur. Um, my past history with this committee clarified that we were at a significantly higher pension benefit uh, offsetting some direct compensation areas where we were not competitive. Uh, this was a discussion about relative contribution to that. I, I'm, the the high, high retirement benefit, low direct compensation has some direct implications on hiring practices of the organization. And I'm not sure we've got that right at this point. Uh, so I I, that's why I raised the issue. I apologize, given the tight agenda, for taking some time on this topic. I don't think we've completed our work with this topic yet, and uh, uh, I will vote to get whatever gains we can get in the budget, but I think there's some more work needed, needs to be done here, and would appreciate an opportunity to see this material. It's helpful, although I have great trust in our committee's ability to, to analyze this issue uh, when there's nothing provided to the rest of the board on the topic. It's, it's a little weak to draw some conclusions from. Okay. Thank you, Regent Fabinius, and I, I see both Regent Simmons and Vice President Brown kind of nodding their heads about mm -hmm. this is going to be revisited and it is a broader topic as far as total compensation. So I'm sure it will uh, occur on the work plan. Vice President Brown. Uh, just one final comment on this topic, I think. We did look at changing that um, scale more dramatically, uh, greater employee employee contribution, less employer contribution, and the savings in the near term were not significant, but, but substantially pushed it down in the total compensation comparables, oddly enough. So you know, I think we are at the right place at this point in time, and we are certainly sensitive to your concerns, and we'll continue to work this up over the next year. Okay, I, uh, Regent Larson. Quickly, <clears throat> I share Regent Frobenius's concerns. Um, as we get into more and more retirements, and we're having uh, some incentives right now, we are going to lose a lot of full professors. If we are not, when you're 30 years old, I don't think too many people are worried about their retirement, very frankly. And if you're a 30 year old, uh, just uh, received your, your PhD, and we're trying to hire outstanding future uh, professors, and we are at a competitive disadvantage on salary in exchange for giving uh, really extraordinary retirement benefits. I, I, sh I certainly share that concern, and I'm not very convinced that with our current setup that we will be able to do that. Now, I'm going to leave that up to 
Vice President Brown and President uh, Kaler to determine for us. But if, if, if my concern and John's concern has any validity, I think we ought to take a look at it. And I think the committee will be discussing that. So I am going to call for the question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. Oh, Regent Simmons, the rest of your report. Thank you. I have another action item to propose. Um, the committee, again, unanimously recommends approval of our consent report, which includes conferral of tenure to four faculty members who've recently been hired at the University of Minnesota. I move approval. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, is there, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The committee had an important presentation made and discussion of advancing faculty diversity and requested additional uh, uh, future agenda time for that issue. We also uh, solicited input from committee members on priorities uh, for the board's work plan, for the committee's work plan, and you'll be happy to know that one of them is a compensation philosophy. Uh, and we look forward to discussing that with the full board, even Regent Frobenius. <laughs> Thank you for your report, Regent Simmons. Pleasure. Uh, report of the Litigation Review Committee of Regent Hung. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Litigation Review Committee did not meet this month. Okay. Is there any old business? Is there any new business? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? Second. The meeting is adjourned.